Uh, hello, yeah, fine. Uh, hello, uh, my name is uh, Enrique Otero. Um, I'm going to talk uh, about uh, training deep learning models on multiple GPUs in the cloud. Uh, so uh, first of all, uh, thank the organizer uh, for considering this topic interesting. And thank you, all you, for being here. I know it's a long time, so I hope you find interesting too this talk. And if not, please, mercy, don't, don't give me. Uh, that's me. Uh, I'm Enrique Otero. I'm a data scientist at Viva. And in this talk, I'm going to briefly introduce uh, deep learning and GPUs. Uh, then I'll go a little deep on uh, training uh, deep learning models, especially uh, image classification models, and some challenges, and also third party benchmarks. And finally, I will share with you uh, some lessons we learned in the process, I think important lessons, about uh, the scientific engineering uh, infrastructure and business's point of view. Uh, well, uh, I briefly introduce uh, Viva. Uh, it's an IT company from the BBVA group. Uh, we are more than 600 uh, employees. Uh, we are growing a lot, uh, also expanding to Latin America. And uh, we are focused on innovation, especially in fields of uh, cloud computing, big data, or machine intelligence solutions. And uh, we are also, uh, uh, we have very uh, big technological partners like AWS, uh, Google Cloud Platform, Microsoft Azure, and also we work with technologies like Spark or Kafka, uh, DevOps technology, Sansible, uh, et cetera. Well, uh, let's start. Uh, deep learning is uh, revolutionizing artificial intelligence, is getting impressive results in fields like computer vision, speech recognition, machine translation or, or ranking. The ranking problems, a typical ranking problem is a recommender system when you have to, to rank the results you offer to the user or customer ordered by the preferences. And also to, to show the success of deep learning, uh, there is a competition called ImageNet for image classification. And in the year uh, 2012, uh, Alex Krzyzewski presented a solution that, it was, uh, that was based on convolutional neural networks. You can see it in orange. Well, in two years, any other contestant, uh, the, the victory or the, the, he won the competition with so hu huge margin that in two years, all the other contestants were using deep learning technologies, deep learning techniques uh, too, instead of all the um, traditional computer vision techniques. Well, uh, actually, uh, neural networks uh, are known for years or decades even. But why now this, uh, this um, impressive success? Yeah, it's uh, mainly due to we have now uh, more data, much more data, especially labeled data. This is very important. Also, we have uh, more computing power and some tricks that uh, make these algorithms uh, work even better than before. Uh, talking about uh, computing power, we started with the CPUs computing. Then we passed the, to the GPU when we scale our problems to, to start to use in the cloud many CPUs. And finally, the high, per, high performance computing stage where we are using uh, many GPUs, as you can say. As Andrew Eng said in, in this slide, uh, deep learning is driven by a scale, and this scale is achieved with many GPUs. And if we talk ab about GPUs, we have to talk uh, about NVIDIA. NVIDIA started as a gaming company, a company for GPU cards for video games. And now it's, it's actually an AI computing platform. <laughs> this is uh, mainly because the rise of CUDA. CUDA is a general purpose uh, GPU programming technology. It's not the only one. Actually, it exists uh, uh, an open standard that is called uh, OpenCL. But finally, NVIDIA uh, became the standard de facto, especially when talking about deep learning. So uh, thank you, gamers, <laughs> because your requirements to have uh, a much, more, uh, uh, much better GPUs for your games finally contributed in a big uh, way to artificial intelligence uh, now at the moment. Uh, well, in, in this slide, we can see uh, the importance of accelerate training. Uh, if, if you see to the, to the left uh, chart, we can see uh, the vertical axis 
a, a more accuracy on the top, less accuracy on the bottom. And on the horizontal axis, we have uh, less computa uh, computational expensive models on the left and bigger model on the right. So we can see that this is a clear correlation when those are uh, state-of-the-art uh, image classification models. And the bigger, the more accurate. But there is a problem that also the bigger are uh, more expensive to compute. And even uh, a low complexity model like AlexNet, that is actually uh, five years old, uh, requires more than 100, like five days to compute with one machine. So accelerated training is, is essential. Uh, well, uh, how to accelerate training? We before uh, need to know how we train deep neural networks. Uh, this, the stochastic gradient descent algorithm is the basis of all of this, uh, joined with uh, a back propagation algorithm also. Uh, how it works? Uh, we have the, the expression, uh, basically we need to compute the, the gradients of the, our loss or cost function. We compute the, those gradients depending on all the parameters of the network. And then we have to update these parameters, also called weights, uh, in the direction of the gradients and applying a multiplying factor that is uh, called usually learning rate. And this is a very important parameter, a hyper parameter, to take into account when, when training uh, deep neural networks. Also, a very important concept is the, the mini batch. Actually, stochastic gradient descent is applied in groups of samples to the input that are called uh, mini batches. And these mini batches are randomly selected uh, from the uh, entire training data set, and that, that provides the stochasticity to the stochastic gradient descent. And it's also a, a, an important concept, as, as we will see in, in this talk. Well, uh, when, when, we wipe, when we try to distribute a stochastic gradient descent, actually we have uh, two ways of, of do it. One is data parallel, and the other is model parallel. They are uh, different. Data parallel is the most common, and basically consists in, in dividing divide the batch size to the input of the network. In each worker resides and processes a partition of the data, and then they have to share this partition of the data and, and share the gradients that they compute in order to advance to the next iteration, in order to accelerate training. Another very different approach is the model parallel, when it's, it's less common and is uh, uh, applied when you have a model that is so huge that it doesn't fit into your, in your GPU. So you need to split, in this case, the layers of the neural network. And each worker uh, work uh, processes only uh, this part of the network. So our different approaches, we are only focusing on the data parallel. That is the common way to, to accelerate training. And also, we have two ways of doing it. One is the uh, asynchronous way and the synchronous. Difference is in the synchronous way, uh, the last worker, the, the one that is the slowest, uh, marks the time because uh, we have to wait for all the workers to finish their computation in order to, to go to the next iteration. Uh, when we do asynchronously, we don't have to wait, so uh, uh, the training is actually faster, but it has a problem. The problem is that the estimation is not the same as in the non-distributed uh, algorithm, so we uh, lose accuracy. So uh, synchronous is, is slower, but it's actually more accurate. Well, this is an external benchmark from Kainer, Kainer.org. Kainer is uh, a, a framework, an open source framework for uh, deep learning, like others, TensorFlow, MXNet. And uh, uh, Kainer is interesting because it's especially focused on efficiency and scalability. And when I first saw this uh, figure, I, I said, wow, uh, with more than 100 uh, uh, GPUs, and they uh, practically uh, fit the ideal speed up. So it's like a panacea. Uh, really, it seems quite good. It's, it's uh, actually so easy. Uh, well, 
Then I started to look other other benchmarks from different frameworks. This is from MXNet, and in this case, we are we can see that different models uh, have very different behaviors, and these uh, ones, Inception ResNet, are not bad, but in this case of AlexNet, actually, our efficiency uh, decayment or degradation is like only uh, 50%. I wouldn't consider that 50% of efficiency when scaling our training is, is good or, or very good. So uh, what's happening? Uh, and uh, actually, it, it's happening a lot of things. The small print is, uh, first of all, you need very high speed connections. Uh, here, we can see the, the configuration of the infrastructure that was used by the Kner benchmark and take into account that they use it infiniband connections. Infiniband is a high bandwidth and low latency connection that replaces the usual Ethernet, and it's a key part of these uh, amazing results that Kainer has shown in the benchmark. There, there is not the only problem, the bandwidth, there are more. <laughs> you can have bottlenecks also in the hard disk. This is not trivial, it's very common that the slowest part of your training system is your hard disk. And it's very curious that many benchmark uh, solves this or circumvent this by using uh, synthetic data. I did a benchmark, but I used synthetic data instead of real data. Well, it's not a very realistic scenario to see if this benchmark is useful for my business purposes or not. And finally, there are even more, more topics to take into account that uh, the possible accuracy penalization when we distribute is like some uh, advice. Don't scale unless you need to, or don't distribute unless you need to, but and sometimes it happens. And also, uh, the number of parameter servers, the parameter server as known in TensorFlow, for instance, uh, is, very, uh, is very important when you are uh, distributing TensorFlow, uh, tuning or choosing a good number of parameter servers. It's not the same if you choose a number that is even or odd or even a prime number. <laughs> it, it seems like, uh, like curious, but it has a huge difference, the, the category of the number, and this is something that you can see in very explicitly and in their documentation. So uh, nobody said it was easy. No one ever said it would be this hard. Actually, it, it's, it's quite hard. Uh, what we've done, what we've done with our first experiments at Viva, uh, we started single node and multi GPU, uh, mainly because in the cloud we didn't find those infiniband connections. It's, we can find it in some clouds, but it's not so usual. So we prefer to start with something that we can control, and this is this configuration: single node, multi GPU. Uh, well, uh, if we are going to the cloud, we're uh, what um, hardware we are going to, to find. This is the most common. Uh, as you can see, uh, uh, NVIDIA Tesla K80 is announced as the world most popular GPU, and this is true. This is so true that you can find it in any of the most common cloud providers. It's in AWS, Microsoft Azure, Google Cloud Platform, different flavors, configurations, but actually the, the, same, the same K80 everywhere. I would say it's quite old technology. And it, was, it is our first experiment. It's something a little silly. It's MNIST dataset. It's known as the hello world of deep learning. And, but it was interesting to see our first results. We were comparing different cloud providers, infrastructures, and different configurations with a framework that is called MXNet that is uh, very good, supported by AWS. But our surprise was that it's not only about efficiency, actually, it's that you can find with some configurations, if they are not very uh, well selected, you can get even worse results or worse, throup worse throughput with eight GPUs and with uh, one. So it's not only about efficiency, it's that you can run uh, you can try to uh, scale, and, and if, if, if you're not choosing the right configuration, you can ruin your, your training. Uh, what we learn? Well, the, one thing that we learn is that we 
should never have been used a MNIST data set to do experiments, is so small and so, mm, uh, so uh, is, is not significant at all. But we use it because it's in every tutorial about deep learning, in, it's the data set that they use. We started with them to learn that you shouldn't use them, uh, you shouldn't use MNIST data set uh, never. Uh, well, but we learn a lot of things, a, a lot of interesting things in the process. Uh, for instance, that if we care about throughput and efficiency, our goal is saturate GPUs, and if we see things like 50%, 70%, if you are not reaching 90% of uh, utilization of your GPU, you, you can do it much better. Your efficiency will be uh, very low. So what we need in order to saturate these GPUs is not trivial. We have to take into account all the possible bottlenecks, and there is bottlenecks in the hard disk, there is bottlenecks in the pipeline of images, even your uh, data augmentation process that is very necessary for getting good results can be a, a bottleneck that can ruin the, the efficiency of your training. And also communications. Communications matter a lot. Uh, we uh, said before that infinite band and high bandwidth communications and interest uh, are necessary to scale out in multiple machines. But the curious thing is not only when you are multi multiple node, but even in single node, communications matter and the, the high speed of your communications. Uh, well, uh, these are uh, two uh, screenshots of uh, Azure uh, and Google similar instances. In one case, uh, four GPUs. In other case, there are uh, eight. As we can see, they are described with is the matrix of interconnections of GPUs. And we can see that actually uh, there are different categories that uh, uh, mark the speed of the interconnections are not the same. Well, this can seem like uh, a minor detail. It's not minor at all. And another thing is the, the support of the GPU Direct. GPU Direct is, is a, a protocol or its implementation by NVIDIA and allows peer-to-peer uh, -peer direct transfers between GPUs. It accelerates a lot the, the transference between GPUs and is not supported uh, 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 everywhere. It was a surprise for us. For instance, it's a proof that it's not supported everywhere in, in the cloud. And this is a test uh, that we perform. It's a bandwidth test when it's, uh, within a, an instance comparing uh, with support of GP, uh, GPU Direct, uh, P2P enabled and disabled. We can see that it's uh, three times slower if you don't support this. And this three times slower can be a, a a very important bottleneck. Well, that's the technical definition of, of a bottleneck, and bottlenecks everywhere when you are training uh, deep neural networks and training to, to scale. Well, uh, from MNIST uh, silly data set, we, uh, we move to another small data set, but not so trivial, that is the Cypher 10, also very typical. And that's our results, uh, comparing, for instance, to frameworks, MXNet, TensorFlow, trying to do similar configurations actually are based like in default examples. And we were surprised also with the, the very dif the high differences in accuracy between implementations that should appear similar at first sight. And well, some of them are quite mm, near from ideal, some others are not. What we learned about this uh, kind of uh, test, that uh, another parameter that we mentioned, the batch size, the number of samples that you enter to the, to the neural network in, in each iteration, is very, very important in terms of efficiency. Uh, what, what happens? A larger batch size uh, reduces communication overhead. And this is very good in terms of efficiency, because uh, you, you are getting more throughput. You are saturating your GPUs more, and it's better in, in, this, in this side. But on the other side, if you take large batch sizes, empirically, you get worse results. This is a very disappointing result, but it happens. Uh, large batch sizes are better for throughput, but worse for accuracy. That was uh, our phase when we realized that uh, we had this kind of problem. It's not about engineering. It's that some parameters have scientific and bad, bad uh, side uh, collateral damage. Well. The good news is that uh, Facebook research in June uh, this year uh, published a, a very, very interesting paper with uh, 
astonishing results that circumvent this problem with the, with the batch size. I recommend uh, that uh, all of you that are interested in this topic read this paper carefully. I will like summarize uh, a little point, but actually it's a lot of details, deeply in details. So uh, in order to get deep in this topic, uh, please uh, uh, read it. But basically, uh, this is the, the relationship between uh, uh, validation error and, and batch size. They uh, get to train an uh, ImageNet dataset that uh, usually takes uh, like days in only one hour, but parallelizing in 256 GPUs, but with some conditions. One condition is that they have to do tricks with the learning rate, basically start small and then get bigger. And then another trick that is uh, like interesting, they said, no, we don't need InfiniBand. We only use like a normal 50 gigabits Ethernet connection, which is not so normal. You can try to find uh, 50 gigabits Ethernet connection, it's not so normal in the cloud. And even more important, with the model, model that they train, that is called uh, ResNet 50, it's a, a state-of-the-art typical uh, image classification model, they get to a very interesting uh, analytical result that in order to avoid loss of efficiency, the minimum bandwidth required will be 15 gigabit per second. So uh, Facebook research are saying, if you are training ResNet 50 with uh, ImageNet uh, sample typical, if you are less than 50, 15 gigabit Ethernet connection, uh, your efficien efficiency will, will degrade. And bah, more things, they use Cafe2. Cafe2 is a very good framework focused in efficiency, especially in, term, in, in the area of computer vision. And other things that I will don't expand myself a lot, but I recommend to read the paper. Well, with all this knowledge, <laughs> uh, all, this, uh, all this knowledge uh, accumulated, we perform our first uh, useful tests. I mean, uh, we are not Facebook. We don't need to train millions of images. What we, uh, what we need is to do something that typically is known as fine tuning, that is to take the state of the art models that are training in millions of samples by Facebook or Google and apply uh, our small data set, but being benefit of the, of the big uh, training processes that was taken before. This is known as, as fine tuning. And we decided to do it with MXNet because in our testers, we, uh, we find it or that MXNet cares uh, much about efficiency. It's also quite easy to, to do it. It's uh, supported by AWS. And also, default configurations work and work fine. For me, that default co configuration work fine is like uh, a good news uh, always. Uh, this was our, our first result. It's not bad. In, in our fi fine tuning, you use the Caltech uh, dataset. It's not so common, but it's also a public dataset. And what we get was like uh, in more than 90, 94% efficiency. It's not bad. Uh, it's like, uh, well, uh, we use it, uh, P2, uh, it's a, a, an instance in, in AWS with 8K80 uh, GPUs. And the result was not bad. This is our, our configurations. This is also a, a playing with the batch size. I said that the batch size uh, affects uh, throughput and accuracy. So we, we consider uh, that uh, we only get a 1% of accuracy. That is quite reasonable. Accuracy loss, I mean. Uh, only with 1% of accuracy loss regarding to the maximum that we could get and we get a 95% of efficiency. Not bad. Well, but what about, what about cost? What about pricing uh, of all these things? Well, if you go to Amazon and you try to purchase a Tesla K80, it's more than $4,000. It's not, not, really, not really cheap. But uh, you can have it in the main clouds uh, around only one dollar per hour that I will consider a very, very good chance to start with deep learning in, in the cloud. Uh, also, uh, take into account that uh, one hour will permit like 4,000 hours of training uh, with the same price uh, required to, 
to buy one for you. And also, there are uh, sustained discounts that are available uh, in all the main cloud providers, but especially in AWS, there's something that is very interesting that are the spot market. In the spot market, you can get like 70% discount. So uh, in this case, you even could, with uh, $4,000, could have 12,000 hours of training. There's a lot. If we think about uh, particular, the one that was performed by Facebook, for instance, could cost between 200 and 700 dollars. But well, uh, particular in Viva, we are not Facebook. <laughs> we don't train the entire magnet, as we said. And the experiment, useful and practical and applied to business experiment that you perform, uh, could cost the, I would say, ridiculous figure of less than two dollars. Uh, well, uh, all this was trained with uh, K80. K80 be, uh, be belongs to the Kepler ar architecture, uh, I said, that is quite old. And actually from uh, 2040. And uh, from Kepler to the last technology that is just new from NVIDIA, Volta, there were two uh, generations of GPUs. One is Maxwell, another is Pascal. They are not so common in the cloud. Uh, for instance, uh, just uh, Google Cloud Platform released in beta Pascal P100, uh, P100 yeah? and uh, this, is, uh, this is better, uh, much better than the K80, but the, the last, the brand new one, is the Volta architecture that is now available since October uh, 2017. Actually, we didn't have tested and th this presentation, but just last week, I updated the presentation because I considered that it was very important. There are the prices. And also, NVIDIA uh, released something that is very interesting. It's called NVIDIA Cloud. Actually, the cloud is uh, not a good name because there are containers, uh, Docker containers with optimized versions of typical frameworks. There is TensorFlow, there is MXNet, Kafi, etc. And engineers of NVIDIA had doing the effort to think about efficiency to make these frameworks even more efficient for you. Not open source at all, but uh, taking care of efficiency in NVIDIA hardware. Well, what happened? We tested, we tested both just uh, this week, it's like very recent results. And what we get is that NVIDIA Volta is, is very good, it's much, much better in terms of uh, throughput for training our experiment than K80s. And also it's not so uh, much better in terms of performance, but is even cost effective. I mean, it, it was expected that it, its throughput was much higher and the times much slower. But also the prices are much expensive. So this, uh, this vertical axe is divided by the cost per hour, the, its throughput by dollar. And even in this case, the green bar and the red bar that are P3 instances, Volta, are much better than, than the others. So is grid performance, cost effective. There is only a little problem, that there are on-demand prices because uh, this very scarce, uh, it was just launched a few weeks ago, it's very scarce, so the spot, spot market in AWS don't work fine with them. It's not easy to get very, spot, uh, very good spot discounts. And then, for summarize, <laughs> I will remark for, for our areas, one, take into account the scientific point of view Please read the paper of uh, uh, Facebook. The engineering point of view, that is the data pipeline matters, even I think so silly as feeding your network, neural network with a dictionary can ruin your, your, trainment, your training. Infrastructure matters, uh, the last, the better. Enabling is better interconnection than PC Express. And if you use Ethernet, please go to uh, high bandwidths. And also Volta, much better than Kepler. And for and the last, uh, pricing matters and spot marketing in AWS is very cost effective. And that's all. Uh, thanks for your time. I'll just say two little things. One, there was uh, two talks uh, related with this topic. One was for by Chris Fregley yesterday. I recommend it. Centered on TensorFlow. Another just in, in uh, Theater 18 by uh, Vyacheslav Kowalewski, a, a Amazon engineer, also quite interesting, centered in MXNet. I uh, recommend you to, to watch them. And, and that's all. 
uh, Viva stand is in the BBVA stand. We are hiring. There are nice people from human resources expecting your resumes. So you can come and talk with them. And thank you, and that's all.